Let's call the meeting to order. Good morning. How's everybody? Um, all right, let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated and please call the roll. Mr. Ryan Hammond. Present. Thank you very much. Um, all right, the first item on today's agenda, it's good to see all of you this morning, is the uh, approval of the minutes from our August meeting. Does anybody have any comments, questions, or concerns on those minutes? Okay, seeing none, do we have a motion to approve then? Motion to approve. The motion is from Mayor Holly Smith, and the second is from Council, or from, yeah, Council Member Wells. I can call you that because you're a TDC Council Member. Um, all right, any other discussion on that? Any public comment on the minutes? Seeing none, then I'll call the question. Are there any objections? No objections. That motion carries unanimously. Uh, let's move on to the public to be heard. Uh, who here from the public wishes to be heard? I see Jack. Go ahead and walk up to the uh, podium, and if you'll say your name and who you're representing for the record. Good morning, Council. My name is Jack Carver. I am with the Florida RV Trade Association. Uh, glad to be back after a long hiatus. Um, Glad to be without a mask, sitting over there in case somebody has a problem. I uh, just want to announce that we will be staging the uh, 36th annual Fort Myers RV show this coming January. Uh, it's, uh, last year we got canceled not only because of the virus, but because of lack of inventory. And uh, the, the business is on fire, as I'm sure many of you have read and know about. Campgrounds will be full this coming season. And uh, we're expecting a large, large number of RVers to uh, come throughout Southwest Florida. So uh, look for our ad starting to appear in January, the last weekend in January, and it uh, should be a great event for the 36th year. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this morning. Who else would like to speak? All right, come on forward. We have Jennifer Nelson from the Captiva Erosion Prevention District. I have to bring Dan because he's the beauty, I'm the brains. No, I'm kidding. Um, so Dan is our technical director. My name is Jennifer Nelson. I'm the executive director for the uh, Captiva Erosion Prevention District. And I just wanted to say thank you to the TDC. Um, this project has been amazing. It's been a big learning experience, I think, for all of us. Um, but I think what really um, has been beneficial is our walk-aheads, being able to meet with uh, the business owners like Mr. Tony over here um, to be able to communicate with the contractors along with the business owners and the residents. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible without uh, your support and definitely your funding. And we're so grateful um, to Lee County and especially the TDC. Um, and we look forward to our partnership in the future. Um, I think, Dan, if you want to share a couple of words about the timelines and the mapping and, and when we'll be done, it's coming. It's coming soon. So um, we're, we're really excited, but I just really want to say thank you. Sure. So they, they've done most of the beach. They're about halfway up, if you, if you know Captiva. Uh, yeah, Captiva. They're about halfway up South Seas Plant uh, Resort. They have almost 4,000 linear feet of beach left on the, on the project for beach fill placement. They've already placed over 700,000 cubic yards of sand. Uh, they're projected to finish their beach fill on roughly October 23rd, 24th, machine, machinery uh, cooperating and storms and all that. But. Yeah, and I also wanted to mention too, um, we are going to be putting out a press release. We're working with Spire and Associates to get a press release out to thank all of our partners. Holly Smith, we could not have done the beginning of this project without Turner Beach. So thank you, Mayor Smith, uh, for allowing us to mobilize and usurp your parking lot for mm, almost a month. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so we will be doing a press release to thank all of our partners. Um, and we are just uh, so excited. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I don't know if y'all have been out there, but if you look at Turner Beach, you'll see we have a much wider beach. Um, so thank you. Looking forward to a day at the beach. We have to check. We all should do a site visit to check that out. <laughs> Any, anybody else wish to speak uh, this morning? 
Okay, seeing no more hands, then we'll go ahead and uh, go to municipalities to be heard. Do we have anything from any of the municipalities? Okay, seeing none, we'll move forward to the report of the executive director. Ms. Piger. All right. In terms of bed tax collection, of course, we're going to be sharing with you both July and August. For July, just <coughs> under $5 million. And for August, uh, $2.87 million. Obviously, both of those are increases over last year. And for year to date, uh, we are at $50.9 million through August. Of course, we have one more month of collection left for this fiscal year. So next month, we will be reporting that full fiscal year. And um, I, the good news is not only are we up over last year, but we're up almost 24% over 2019. So good news for our uh, tax collectors. The spoiler alert, best year ever. That best year ever. But I mean, that was it. That's the I, best year ever, and we still have one more month to report of collections. That's, that's incredible. Thank you for what you guys do. In terms of uh, the STAR report, you see in July, 73% occupancy ADR at 170.84 for a rev par of 124.82. And for August, 55.7% uh, occupancy, 140.22 for the ADR, and a $78.08 rev par. Again, all numbers over uh, the previous year. In terms of the key data, this is the vacation rental data occupancy, and to clarify, uh, uh, non-owner occupancy, 73% ADR, 235 and the rev par of 171 for July. And for August, 42%, 209 for the ADR and $88 for rev par. So again, strong performance on the vacation rental side as well. RSW had a great month in July, 814,471 uh, passengers through the airport. And in August, 647,534, again, both increases uh, over, over the previous year and 2019. And year to date for RSW, they're at just under 7 million, um, almost back to 2019 level. And uh, obviously the last several months have been, you know, we just missed a little bit in January and February. So um, I think as we go through the rest of the year, you'll see that number pop up above above uh, 2019. Couple uh, of, uh, we've got staff to give reports and I'm gonna invite Jill Vance to come up and give the sales report. Good morning, Council. I'm Jill Vance, Director of Sales and I am happy to report that the, this recap of our year-end results for this past fiscal year's um, sales goals, we have either attained or surpassed all annual goals. Group media. Here are just a few examples of last quarter. Um, meetings media, I conducted a destination presentation on the August Meetings Today webinar, which uh, over 500 attendees um, registered and there is a recording is available on the Meetings Today website. For Travel Trade, on the left is an example of one of our print ads at Agent at Home, of which has readership of almost 32,000 travel advisors. And then for our Weddings Media, I love this one. On the right is the Bridal Guide Weddings Quiz Sweepstake. It's entitled, Find the Perfect Resort for Your Honeymoon or Destination Wedding. And then the audience is then directed to take a quiz, asking questions like, what is your perfect date? What photo best matches your wedding style? And of course, they're all photos of the destination. And I think it's a really clever way to highlight all a lot of details about the destination and still keep the user engaged. Um, once their perfect property is revealed, they then can enter to win a honeymoon at Diamond Head Beach Resort, who kindly donated that package. So this promotion began in July, and through the end of August, there were over 6,000 page views. 
the sweepstakes received almost 1,400 entries, and that exceeded Bridal Guide's benchmark by 55%. Here are some of the group sales team's activities for last quarter. As most of you know, the sales team is back on the road and we have hit the ground running. On the left are several pictures of both Betsy and Erin. They're meeting one-on-one -on -one and networking with meeting planners at a variety of shows. And then in the middle is a photo of Jerry conducting a meeting planner destination presentation. And then on, on the top right, I do wanna highlight in collaboration with the Lee County Economic Development and Sports Development Departments, Jerry represented the VCB with some meeting planners at the Twins Lee County Day um, client event up in Minneapolis. Some travel trade activities for last quarter. We conducted almost 100 sales calls to travel agencies and they were agencies in Chicago, Northern Florida, Southern Ohio, and also Boston. And the travel agents were very happy to see us in person. In fact, most said that we were one of the first GMOs uh, to come see them. And they also shared uh, some common feedback that I wanna share with you, that their clients who would typically vacation in international locations um, are frequently choosing to travel to Florida instead. Although we can't wait for our international visitors to come back next month in November, uh, it's good to know that we are getting some residual domestic business while the borders have been closed. Next are our upcoming activities for the domestic sales team. And I just want to point out one for October. Next week, Shelly will be attending the Travel and Adventure Show in San Francisco as a precursor to the new United Airline direct flights from San Francisco and LAX that will begin on December 16th. And then I just wanna highlight for November, Jerry will be attending the IMAX America event in Las Vegas. So before the pandemic, this show was the largest hosted buyer show in North America. It attracted over 4,200 qualified meeting planners. So this year, once again, we will be in the Visit Florida booth, whose location is front and center upon entrance uh, to the exhibit hall. So this great location not only generates a lot of walk-up business for us, but it also enables our marketing team's geofencing efforts to be even more effective. Are there any questions before I turn it over to Tam Pigott, who will give you a quick international update? Any questions at all? All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks Jill. So just a very brief update on the international side. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at IPW. That was the first uh, international show to happen uh, in the U.S. and uh, had 25 appointments over the two days that I was there. Canada, Germany, Austria, Denmark, UK, and Benelux were the primary people I was able to meet with. And we were also able to participate in a um, reception with the top tour operators uh, that was hosted by US Travel. It was definitely a smaller IPW, um, but the good news is during the event, of course, it was announced that the, um, the air borders are opening and that you know starting in November, we would be able to welcome get international guests to the U.S., vaccinated international guests to the U.S. So exciting times. Um, big news this week, of course, the land border crossing between the U.S. and both Canada and Mexico will also open in November. Again, vaccinated travelers will be able to cross the border. This ends restrictions that have been in place for 20 months. So. I know everybody will be happy to welcome their Canadian guests back. I know that's a very strong market for us, so that is the big news of this week. And then up next on the international side, um, at the end of the month, uh, we will be participating in Brand USA Travel Week. We have 42 appointments. There are two Brand USA evening events, and we are also hosting a client event. So that is the international update. Now I'm going to ask. Simone Baer to give us an update from Visitor Services. Good morning, Council. Happy to be here reporting on Visitor Services uh, for the fourth quarter, July through uh, September. We, um, during that time period, our volunteers were assisting 40,182 um, visitors. They worked 3,629 volunteer hours of a value of $103,572. 
We gave out um, 2,912 travel guides and sent 6,800 brochures to the Visit uh, Florida Welcome Centers. The top request that we had during that time period in terms of accommodations was the Drury Inn at the airport, the Pink Shell Beach Resort in South Seas. For attractions, this is aside from the beaches and shopping, we had uh, Ding Darling, uh, the Shell Museum on Sanibel, and Edison and Fort Winter Estates. The top activities was shelling, canoeing, kayaking, as well as bike trails and cycling. The uh, four visitor services staff, the highlights for our community and partner support. Um, the big one, of course, was the E Awards in August. We also attended the Destination International Visitor Services Summit, Hyatt Regency Coconut Point site visit, assisted with, uh, with Island Hopper, Songwriter Festival, attended the uh, Port Authority Annual Review, as well as FGCU Fall Service Learning Fair, and Customs and Border Annual SEAL Training. On September 19th, we had a really, really fun day at RSW. One of our volunteers dressed up uh, as a pirate to celebrate uh, National Talk Like a Pirate Day. I don't know if you knew that existed, but it does. It's a nationally recognized uh, holiday. Every year, he dresses up as a pirate. Uh, we give out shell necklaces and some pirate um, goodies. And uh, I think whoever travels through RSW during that time period will... Uh, remember this very well, so I think they, everybody had a lot of fun with it. Our volunteers also welcomed the songwriters as they were arriving at RSW for the festival. And our volunteers are back assisting with conferences that are um, being hosted. We um, were at Sanibel Harbor Marriott as well as Calusa Sound Convention Center. They assisted with registration at the Spirit of 45 World War II uh, Veterans Tribute Dinner. Uh, looking ahead, we have quite a number of destination training tours coming up for our tourism ambassadors. We are offering guest first customer services classes again. Our volunteers assisting with registration at Roy Hobbs. Uh, we have a number of new volunteers that we've recruited that are currently in training. And we're um, prepping for our volunteer, our annual volunteer holiday potluck at Lakes Park. So that's it for me. Are there any questions? Any questions for Simone? Oh, All, right. All right, I will pass it on to uh, Nancy McPhee. All right, we're going to skip over the public relations report. We will have a report for you uh, ahead on that. They were very busy hosting uh, travel writers and, and uh, guests, and we're excited about that. One thing I do want to share with you from the public relations team is the what to do, uh, the, the weekly list of things to do in the area will resume on November 1st. So for, look for that in your, in your mailboxes starting uh, November 1st. Uh, events are starting to happen again and it's time to get that list going again. So we're excited to have that back out to you. I know guests really enjoy that. And now I'm gonna ask Nancy McPhee to give us a little recap on Island Hopper Songwriter Fest. Thanks, Tam. Um, I just wanted to thank the TDC for your continued encouragement of the VCB hosting this event. Um, as you know, it began in 2014. This was our seventh year. We did take a break last year. So what I'm going to provide is just a really brief recap. We're really not done measuring the marketing effects and um, rooming um, room revenue from this year's festival. So this is just a short recap. So a year ago, we, we knew that we weren't going to do Island Hopper, and the team pivoted along with our partners at iHeart, and we developed a virtual event, as many events across the country did during the pandemic. And this was an attempt to keep our uh, fans following us, keep Island Hopper top of mind, and it also was really um, fun for the songwriters. They, they were not able to perform live in many cases, and they really enjoyed the opportunity to come live with us from their living room, from their sofa. So the team interviewed them live once a month. We had maybe 800 to 1,000 people view each month, with a total of, uh, over the course of 16 months, 12,000 views on our social channels. And you can see the breakout of the different channels. So it was really fun. Um, one thing that we were pleased with was Florida Festivals and Events added a new category last year um, for their conference for virtual events. And Island and Songs from the Sofa actually won an award, a sensational award. And this was the fifth year that Florida Festivals and Events has recognized Island Hopper. So we were excited about that. 
in February, we, we were ready to transition to the sand. So we developed songs from the sand. This was an attempt to bring performances live from our beaches, right? So we did it three different times on different beaches throughout the destination. Um, the top shot there is from the pink shell. We um, you utilize both local, that Sheena Brook in that top shot, and um, artists from Nashville to accomplish this. And it, again, gave a sneak peek of those songwriters that were confirmed to play the festival this year, as well as showing our followers the beauty of the destination. So we were pleased with that transition. So <clears throat> um, we also, the team uh, at the VCB was very engaged. You know, they love planning Island Hopper, I have to say. It's one of the highlights in addition to everything else they do. But we knew that we needed to be safe. You know, we wanted to bring back the event we um, tr implemented several things to make it safe for our songwriters, staff, and visitors. 96% um, of the venues, there was 21 in all, were outdoor venues. So that was one thing that we felt comfortable doing, being outside. We made personal protective equipment available at every single venue. Um, we put air purifiers in those indoor venues that we used and we went contactless. And this isn't something we like to do. The VCB volunteers and staff are very much interested in inter interacting with our guests. But to be safe, we put the online surveys that we do every year um, through a QR code. Uh, we didn't get as many surveys back, probably because boomers, who were the uh, top um, demographic of Island Hopper, perhaps aren't comfortable with um, online type surveys. But these were the mechanisms we put in place. We knew there was hesitation on travel, coming to the area, um, but we felt that we pulled off what, you know, this is the new norm, how are you gonna do an event? We felt like we succeeded in that respect. So highlights overall for the festival this year, we had 78 songwriters. That's down a little bit from previous years, and that's on purpose. Um, we did implement the use of uh, more local songwriters than we ever have because there was hesitation on the part of some songwriters for, for traveling here. There were 113 performances at 21 different venues on Captiva, downtown, and on Fort Myers Beach, and we implemented about five ticketed events. Remember, the bulk of the 113 performances are free. So in order to um, spark interest and excitement and hopefully drive room night bookings, we did implement five ticketed events that I'll talk about in a minute. So overall for marketing, which again, we didn't do everything we've, we've done in the past. We didn't do commercial TV in Tampa, which has really garnered great results for us. Um, we cut back quite a bit. We did uh, in-market and out-of-market radio with our iHeart partners, print ads, digital ads, social, email, and, and web with a total impressions of about 31.5 million. Um, the, one of the most successful things we do and continue to do well is our social channels. We have a team that uh, has a really a lot of fun. Uh, we grew the team this year, thanks to Amanda and Courtney for leading the effort. So we have more staff at the VCB well-versed in um, engaging with our followers on social media that they can use in their regular job, be it visitor services, sales, whatever. So we saw increases on Facebook of 30% engagement with our, with our followers and Instagram of 17%. So we're really excited and pleased um, with the results of our social campaign. Likewise, our agency cross-promoted the festival on the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel social channels and garnered six million impressions. They um, designed some gifts uh, for us, which garnered 33 million views and gifts, as, I'm, as I've been explained. Um, every time a GIF is used, be it our staff, an industry partner, like one of the hotels, or a visitor in the destination, that they can be measured. So that, that's a fun way. Um, the team had a really good time creating stories every day using those GIFs. And then the link clicks. Of course, we want them to come back to our website, be it the destination's website or Alan Hopper's website. We had 15,000 link clicks from our, from our social posts back to our websites. And speaking of websites, this is where everything that we do points, right? We want it to point back to onhopperfest.com, all of our market drives eyes there. We refreshed the website last August. It's much more crisp, easier to navigate. Um, the, the songwriter, there's a songwriter navigation tab where you can take a deep dive and learn about the songwriters, who they are, link back to their sites. So um, we did see, um, 
reductions compared to 2019 in the sessions on the website. But again, I think people are engaging with us more on social using our app. And uh, we have lots of loyal followers, so they may not need to refer to the website every time. Our PR team did a great job uh, generating online news stories and uh, broadcast that, that had a combined reach of about 8 million. Um, they also did a fantastic job bringing journalists in. We had three journalists that represented four publications, Texas Lifestyle, Country Now, Paste Magazine, and Music Mayhem. And they not only attended lots of shows, um, but they also enjoyed, they were up every morning with us, <laughs> and they went out and enjoyed the destination. They went to Cabbage Key, they went to Ding Darling, they went to um, paddling. You can see the middle photo. They paddled um, between Tween Waters with uh, probably eight manatee that morning, Tony. It was really fabulous. So they have already written about us. I think four stories have been generated. Um, Paste Magazine wrote two stories on both the experience uh, with wildlife viewing and the festival and the combination of all the stories that have already dropped and we're still expecting a few more is about 1.2 million. So I mentioned ticketed experiences. This is one of my favorite things and this is something we do a lot as we work to mentor our event partners. And that is to, you know, this is a free event mostly. It's not gated. How do you count? people, how do you drive room nights and know that you've been successful? So ticketed experiences allow us to hopefully package with a hotel, allow us to count, and it provides a kind of a surprise and delight, special um, experience for our visitors. So we did two intimate performances, thanks to our partners at Royal Shell and American Realty on Captiva, and they were in the living rooms of these magnificent vacation rentals. And they also included book signings. Both of those songwriters had written books, and it was really an interesting component to add. We had our annual songwriter dinner at the Barrel Room downtown, which is always very well attended. Michael Ray performed at Pinchers, and Jimmy Allen, who, as we were confirming him to play, American um, the Academy of Country Music named him the new male, best new male artist of the year. So we were really lucky to land him. It was really a fantastic show. That was the final show with Pink Shell. Um, we implemented a mobile app in 2018 and it has been, become a very useful tool. Again, we have printed less schedules and um, information than we ever have because everything's in the app. So we had 2,700 downloads. People are engaging with that tool for about an average of 19 minutes, which is a very long time. So you're navigating through the app, you're seeing where, where your favorite performer is playing, you can create your own schedule so that you know where you're going. The good thing is we can message our, our um, followers. We had a, a weather event on the very first night on Captiva. We were able to say this show is canceled or this show's moved inside and you know, beware, it's going to storm, that kind of thing. So we, you can see across the bottom where our followers are coming from. Again, Tampa remains very strong for Island Hopper. We target Tampa a lot. So we're very pleased. If you have any doubts, Amanda Auer is our app expert. Um, Olympa is the company we use, and we've had several other festivals follow us. I'm sorry, not follow us, but they've um, engaged with apps for their events because of the success we've had. And so it's really been a fun tool. So overall, the total impressions marketing and PR is 39 million. Again, I mentioned it's down from 2019. We, we did a little bit less marketing and we um, had a few less shows. And there was hesitation, obviously, with travel. So attendance. How do you measure an event that's not gated? It, it's something that I, I stay awake at night trying to wrap my head around it. We know that we had 21 venues. The capacity of each of those, probably 15,000 would have been the capacity if every one of them was full. So we're estimating, based on our survey results and staffs, measuring about 12,300 attendees this year. But don't forget, we're encouraging people to stay for multiple days. So you're counting, perhaps, Pam Cronin more than once because she stayed for three days. So um, at Tam's encouragement, Brian engaged with Arrivalist this year. And if you're unfamiliar with Arrivalist, they're a company that measures unique, um, through mobile devices, they can measure unique visitation. So um, without going to a big explanation, they, they 
measured Captiva, downtown Fort Myers Beach, and they came up with 5,600 unique visitors. So they're not gonna count my phone twice. They might see me on Captiva, they might see me downtown, they're not gonna count my telephone t twice, my number. They can also determine where I'm from, if I'm local, because the phone is here for a long time, or, the, or if I'm from out of area. So they determined downtown was primarily a lo local audience, Fort Myers Beach and Captiva had more visitors, obviously booking those rooms that we, that we hope is happening every year. So again, the, the lodging partners are really the key to this. We couldn't do it without them because we don't pay the songwriters. Those that do come in from far away, those notables that uh, you know we, we love to invite, uh, they might get a travel stipend, but we're putting them up thanks to our lodging partners who donated 69 rooms um, during the festival. Um, they posted 16 deals on islandhopperfest.com, some of which we haven't gotten results back on, so that's why I mentioned we'll be uh, able to finalize numbers on room nights later. But we did survey those contactless surveys. 340 people told us that they booked rooms. 23% of them booked four more nights. So my estimate by going through those surveys that we took is about 526 room nights were generated just based on the survey. That's not feedback from our hotel partners. And we also had our uh, venues, restaurants, and bars report that business that week or that weekend when we were with them was up, certainly over last year, and either flat or slightly up over 2019. So the final slide is bed tax. We can't, we can't tell you because we're not done um, counting September's bed tax for 2021. But you know, you asked us to deliver an event in September many years ago. I remember Renee was, was on the TDC at the time. And we hope that Island Hopper is contributing to these increases in bed tax revenue each September. We didn't do Island Hopper last year, but it was a good September last year. Obviously, everybody was home or traveling here to work from home from uh, the destination. So we are looking forward to delivering September bed tax numbers to you next month. We uh, enjoy Island Hopper. We know our partners, are, they tell us that they love it. Uh, so we think it's doing what you asked us to do for the month of September. And uh, we really appreciate you allowing us to continue doing it. So I have one last short little video that I'd like to share. Some of our industry partners uh, are reporting to us how they feel about Island Hopper in it. This weekend has been astronomical. It's been amazing to have this business here, especially after 2020, you know? Our room reservations, we are sold out of rooms. We are doing astronomical in all aspects, especially with the partnership we have with Island Hopper. What you'll see over this entire week that we're just really enjoying this Island Hopper, it shows who we are, what we are, and what we do. An event like this is always lots of fun. I mean, we love the music, the staff loves the music. Um, everybody that comes to it always has a great time. So when you've got an event that has that much positive energy to it, it boosts the staff as well as the, uh, the party goers. We need to bring our girlfriends here. This is a moment that has to be captured. It's incredible. It was so exciting. We had such a great time. We would not want to miss it for the world. We're, we'll be here every year, for sure. We're really kind of in the center of it all, and we are a, an emerging community. We're growing, we're in a renaissance on the island right now. You see everyone walking the streets and talking to each other and laughing. Small, you know, young people, older people, families, individuals, making friends and making friendships that last from year to year. It's really an amazing weekend on Fort Myers Beach. That is my report. If you have any questions. Any questions for Nancy? Yeah, Mr. Wells. <clears throat> I love the event. I think the artwork has been incredible the entire time, I, you know, the, from, from the beginning. Um, it just, to me, we all talk about how we're going to bring in this, this next generation of traveler. And I, 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 you know, I know you're trying to do contactless um, surveys, so it may be hard to tell, but I mean, you have to just assume that it's probably a, a younger um, group than what we might appeal to normally here. Um, so I, 
there's so much I think we could build on this moving forward. Um, and I guess that'd be the question. How do you, what do you see for future years? Um, is there a chance that we do more where we do kind of a couple more of these paid time starts, maybe bring in some bigger ads? Because just the amount of PR that we probably get from the event, you know, nationwide attention at this point could be a bigger value for the area than even the number of visitors still in the hotel rooms on that day. Um, right. Well, I think that, um, so first of all, the demographic is the, the baby boomer age group. That's the most, that we get more of them than anything else. I think it all is, it boils down to the act. So we, we would like to diversify, you know, maybe move some other genres in, not just country, because I think that could affect the age. I think younger people would come if we, you know, implement different genres of music. Um, we do want to continue with Songs from the Sand on a quarterly basis, which will, which could have an audience. We're still working that out with iHeart. So, you know, we could go to one of the resorts that is a host for Island Hopper and showcase one of the, you know, bigger acts from Nashville. We would like to do more, but I think the community can do more. I know, I think um, Tween Waters and even Pink Shell is, has, since Island Hopper was born, I've seen them do their own poolside shows as a result. And I think that's what we're hoping with Island Hopper is that there's going to be organic growth within the destination, not just the VCB driving it, right? So I, uh, we're happy to explore other, I know we're waiting for the amphitheater to finish, and, and I think the Luminary is very interested in some concerts, you know, that, that we can help them identify talent for. So we have had these discussions. Some of it's contingent on budget because production and the payment uh, for a bigger act would come from our media partner. We, we're, we're, we try to focus on paying for marketing. So sponsors. You know, Nancy, too, I just want to comment on the crowd and how the people act. I mean, sometimes you get that many people together with that much alcohol and stuff, you think there's going to be problems. I talked to my pool bartenders who had that one day Saturday. It went from, God knows, from 10.30 in the morning till 10.30 at night, it seemed. And there really wasn't any problems at all. And I don't know, Bill, if you've experienced the same thing. It's, oh, it's the music. Sure, it's and, no issues. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty interesting when you have that amount of people together. It's just, uh, I think, the music and the, and the way things lay out. It's just pretty cool the way it all happens. So congratulations to to the VCB staff, because they knock themselves out. I know they do every year. And uh, this was a great accomplishment this year. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge team effort, the whole yeah, VCB oh yeah. And you know, that was gonna be my last comment about this was, you know, hats off to this team. I mean, I, you have no idea how many hundreds of hours pulling this event off takes. And they bust their hump on this. And, um, you know, just really, really proud of them. And, you know, I know the numbers are down for this year, but the Delta variant going into this was raging, if you guys remember, and people were, you know, really hesitant. And to end up with numbers like we ended up with, and to have that many venues, um, you know, have the opportunity to host this event, I'm just really proud of what we did here. So, Nancy, you know, I know, I know they're all listening because, uh, you know, they they will. And a, a special thank you to Jeff for allowing Tommy to participate in the event uh, this year. Really a great partnership between our departments on pulling off these events and using our resources, um, you know, to the best ability uh, that we can. And, um, you know, our between our volunteers, our staff, and, and uh, you know, uh, other staff around the county who helps us as well <laughs> to help these things get executed, you know, we're really proud of it. And, um, you know, the, the needle is moving in September, you know, it is. And, you know, when you, I know, you know, you saw in 18 and 19 it was down, but you want to remember why 18 and 19 bed tax was down. We had raging red tide in 2018, and in 2019 we had a storm. So, you know, those things affect, you know, there are things that are outside of our control, but the growth in the popularity of Island Topper is not diminished. It's just other situations have diminished attendance. But I feel really strongly that not only is this a great event, um, it, it just has the potential. And Tony, what you've done, shame on everybody else for not jumping on that bandwagon, you know. I mean, it, it, you are filling, when you do those songwriter weekends, you're sold out, right? Very, it's very popular. We did the one on the beach that was just a, a, unbelievable. Uh, it worked out great, and, and 
we, you know, like I said, you just sort of rode your coattails in. It and was working out well. And when we started this, that was our intent. We'll build this, you know, momentum for this, but that the private sector should be taking up, <laughs> building upon it and building their business around it. And, you know, I hope that continues to happen. But it, uh, Tween Waters is an excellent example of how you can take that three-day event on Captiva and turn it into something that he's doing every quarter or every three or four times a year. Tony, maybe you do it every month. I don't know now. Uh, yeah, we do. Sometimes we bring it one time, but we had a kind of a major weekend that we used. Right. And it was nice, especially in June, you know. Uh, sometimes there's a little lull there. It worked out pretty well for us. So I good. think it, I, you know, it just really, there's a lot of potential to build on that success. And I think, you know, watching the private sector take that, that aspect of it over is really what we're trying to encourage. Do you have dates for next year? Um, it's the last two weekends and the week in between. I think it's, what is it, Amanda, the 20, 16th to the 25th, I want to say. We didn't put that slide up. It is a true product development initiative, I have to say. The staff grows. Our event partners learn from us because we can better coach them on their own events. Fifth, I think that says. Well, thank you. Very good. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Oh, yeah, Mr. Wells, one last thing. Just a couple other thoughts. The, uh, Tony, were all of your acts country slash folk? Pretty much so. Yeah. The Winster and the Island Hockey was country. Yeah. yeah. Um, I understand about the appealing to greater audiences, but I also think that when you bring people in on a certain list, there's something that seems special about that, too. And um, so I don't have any issue with the idea of keeping it around the similar genre, whether it be folk or country or whatever. But I don't know if you start branching out if you don't kind of lose the focus of the event a little bit. Um, <coughs> just my thought. Um, also, I noticed for the people that live in Lee County, 30% of them almost, uh, the attendees were Lee County residents. And I know they, uh, I know they, you hear them when you're walking around and you're talking to people about it. And that really is great. I know our job is to put uh, people in hotel rooms. You're doing that, but the county's benefiting from, from these events too. And, and that was pretty special, I think. If I, if I can add to that, you know, in talking to a lot of the people, I talked to a lot that were from drive locations, Tampa, and, you know, everybody seems to make friends when you say that the type of demographic there, everybody wants to be there. A comment on a different genre. My husband um, just got back from Austin City Limits, and I was supposed to go to that, but my young son, who's 23, ended up flying in because I had city business and couldn't go. Austin City Limits started off as all country, um, smaller, and when I said, hey, I, I can't go to my 23-year-old son, he's like, oh, let me look at who's going to be playing. And there were a lot of bands that he actually was enticed by as well. So maybe not a full shift, but, but looking at something that's as big as Austin City Limits, and they, they realized that maybe their market had to change a little bit. A and they have over time, and it's drawing in a lot more people from all different age groups uh, to be there. So just a thought from what they saw. And in fairness, I mean, I definitely see younger people there. If you go to the events, there are a lot of young people there. I just, you know, are they filling out the survey? Are they the ones we're talking to? I mean, I think, you know, saying the boomer generation is our number one demographic is no surprise to anyone. But I think, Bill, uh, you know, you can say what you saw at the event. I'm sure that, you know, it, it's a mix of people, young, old. Jimmy Allen, he brought in. It was, a, it was a mix. I mean, probably 30% were, you know, millennials. I mean, it was very young also. So it was a big mix there. But what was nice was is that we had a lot of guests that were local that stayed in the hotel. I mean, they used, made a staycation out of it, too. So. And, and, you know, I mean, the, the benefit to, in food and beverage to all the restaurants and bars around the community, even if it's locals being driven in, to see their numbers up, it's good news for our community. So it has, you know, it has multiple layers. Anecdotally, as somebody who goes to the concerts we used to pay for, like you see two generations there. Like, you know, my daughter would go, and then you have people like older than me. But like, it is country music does encompass multiple generations. I think, I think you know, not necessarily like. So I'm not sure. Like just like what Rob says, I'm not sure the genre needs to change too much. I think it's like we can add things and see where it goes. But when I, you know, I go to those concerts, it's everybody. Yeah. I mean, it's a 
gap between some of the people, and it's quite funny to watch. So. And a little feedback from the songwriters uh, at the Captiva event um, to kick things off. Many of them came up and were like, thank you so much for all the safety measures you put in place. So again, you know, the staff really did go above and beyond to make everybody feel comfortable. And you know, some of those songwriters were hesitant. I mean, you know, uh, you know, our numbers were down a little bit in terms of the number of participants, but the ones who came really were grateful for the things we did. So again, Nancy, you know, please convey that to the team. All right, I have one other thing I want to share with you, and then I will conclude my report. It's been a long one, I realize. Um, we are about to launch our new website in December, and as part of that, you must do your final updates to your listing by October 31st. We're going to lock down the system for the month of November until we launch the new site. So the last day to update your listing on our website is 5 p.m. Sunday, October 31st. So get your, get your listing updated. And then uh, all 1,000 plus listings will be transferred over into the new version of the website. But we need a little bit of time to do that migration. So deadline to do that update again, one last time. Halloween day, get it done. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, sir. Good deal. Thank you, Jam. All right, so we now have the report of the Sports Development Director, Jeff. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and good morning, Council. Um, uh, good to be before you today. It's been a little bit. Um, our, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. We are dragging our reports a little bit um, due to heavy agendas and, and not having a meeting last month. So I'm going to go through April, May, and June today, and then uh, either November, December, we'll have um, we'll be caught back up again. So uh, going through April, um, uh, 4,300 hotel room nights filled uh, with a direct visitor spending of two million dollars. A couple uh, events of note was the um, Canada's national softball team. Um, that's their Olympic team. They uh, decided to um, land. Um, call our community home for 45 days and train for the Tokyo Olympics. And um, they, they had great success. They ended up winning the bronze medal. Um, they were very competitive. They lost to uh, uh, Japan, one nothing, which won the gold. And they lost to USA, which won the silver, one nothing. So they were very competitive. Uh, and in a lot of conversations we had with them post Olympics, they, they, they gave Lee County a lot of credit for their success. They, um, you know, they're Canadian, they were up north. Um, Tokyo Olympics were 95 degrees and, and high humidity, and so they were able to acclimate for 45 days here, um, got the girls in great shape, and, uh, and put on a, a great competition uh, on the world stage. So we were happy to host that. Um, they also played Team Italy. Um, Team Italy came over from the East Coast and spent a long weekend here um, playing against uh, uh, Team Canada and, and uh, Unfortunately, no fans were allowed because of all the COVID protocols that go along with the Olympics, but uh, it was great to see. We also hosted USA Swimming uh, event. Uh, their World Water National Championships came back to the beach, uh, to uh, Fort Myers Beach after uh, being, being gone for three or four years, and they're coming back again in 2022. So it's great to see uh, one of our Olympic national governing bodies uh, putting the national championships in our community. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that we are slightly down over what we normally are, and that really is, a, is an effect of Florida youth soccer still just isn't back to the, hosting their events the way they normally do because of COVID. So they're still having these very regionalized where teams don't have to travel um, throughout the, their region to play in their age group state cup or commissioner's cup final. So um, I think next year as, as everything's starting to open up, our because we usually – host at least two or three FYSA state cups and um, or commissioner cups in April and those are usually eight to 800 to a thousand rooms each so a couple of those events you can see we're right back into the six thousands again going to May 11,600 room nights from sports um, 3.9 million dollar direct visitor spending uh, a lot of uh, a lot of that came from um, uh, 
came from baseball, but not all of it. Um, we had a, a very large uh, Memorial Day tournament. Uh, we also had the FHSA Baseball State Championships. We will have that again in 2022. That will be um, that will be our final year of this contract, but we think we'll we'll renew that contract again for another three years. Um, we had a Florida so Bowling Association Women's State Championships as well um, as a National High School Gymnastics Association event. You can see May is, uh, is right in line as it typically is. Go to June. Getting into the meat of the summer now. 16,500 room nights through sports. Um, $7.2 million direct visitor spending. Uh, six events through Perfect Game. So you can see they filled 13 of the 16,000 room nights. Um, we did bring in a couple new partnerships that we, we think are going to grow really well. Called the, one's called the Basketball Alliance. Uh, one was called Premier Girls Fast Pitch. Um, they start, they've started off as fairly small, but we, we see a lot of growth and we see uh, a lot of synergy um, with them as an emerging partnership of ours. Um, then we also, yes, sir. They play the basketball. I'm just curious. Um, we, we do that in partnership with Lee County Parks and Recreation, so Wackahatchee, Estero, um, North Fort Myers, Veterans, Lehigh Veterans Park typically is where we start, that's, that's nine hardwood courts, and then if we need more than that, then we overflow into um, our, some of our high schools. Um, then flag football took place at uh, Kelly Road Soccer Complex. Um, June was, was again pretty much uh, in line with what we expect. Um, so that's that's those three months. I will say um, I really look forward to reporting for July to you guys in a month or two. Um, we we rarely rare, rarely set our records, but uh, July was was over the top um, this year. Um, as always, I want to say thank you. Uh, Jesse Lavender's in the room. Um, we have an amazing partnership with our parks team. Um, we're really very cohesively bound with them as far as event management, uh, facility use. Um, uh, we have great partnership with Red Sox and Twins and using those, those facilities. Um, our sports organizing committee, our housing services is ste stepping up and you know, helping during these hard times. So we just uh, have this amazing group of individuals out in, our, out in our community that are helping make sports tourism a really impactful place for us right now. So. Any questions? Yeah, Mr. Wells. Uh, having a daughter that's now like traveling all over the place with this volleyball and the craziness that <laughs> kind of surrounds it and all the people that travel around the state and do it, um, it seems like there's a lack of gyms for them to play at them when they're traveling to Naples to practice, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and it reminds me of this uh, mutual friend we had all these years ago that was talking about building potentially a basketball facility and they would lease it out to people. Do you find a, that you have a shortage around Lee County to go after sort of youth, maybe basketball, I'm thinking indoor type activities, volleyball, basketball, those kind of things? Um, would it be a help if there were more of those? Um, you know, traditionally I've thought a lot of baseball and outdoor activities when I think of Lee County. Yeah, so we, again, we have this great, these great recreation centers with, with, with Lee County Parks and they're hardwood floors and, and as they built them, we, we put them to good use. You know, really being careful not to over overuse them and at the expense of our citizens. But what we do lack is a larger facility that has more courts under one roof. Um, when I just you know I just got back from a conference and you know we promote our destination for basketball and volleyball, but we're limited to what we can put in the number of, of facilities that we have available. Uh, well, really the number of courts we have available under under a roof. So. Um, a lot of these bigger basketball and volleyball co companies now are wanting um, larger venues that are popping up here and there. So, are they privatizing those though? Aren't they more? It's a mix. Yeah. So you look around the state. Um, there's not a ton of them in the state of Florida yet, but um, about half of them are privatized and half of them are um, owned and managed by municipalities. I think it's a great conversation to have. See if we can. Uh, Look for a good spot to, um, I know where you got a lot of big, empty, big box stores in North Fort Myers. <laughs> Maybe they could be turned into gyms or knocked down or something like that. Um, well, very good. Any other questions for Director Melke? All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, we will move on to new business on the agenda. And um, Kim, do you want to explain the uh, meeting change, the date change here? So I'm asking for your permission to move the next TDC meeting date uh, to 9 a.m. on the November, uh, excuse me, November 9th, which would be just before our annual meeting begins at 10 a.m. So we'll have a quick TDC meeting there at Sanibel Harbor Marriott before the annual meeting, rather than asking you to come to the annual meeting on Tuesday and then come back to to a meeting on Wednesday. Our current meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, November 10th, but this way you get in place, you're there to see the annual meeting, and uh, as you saw when you came into the room, we've got Samantha Brown as our, our keynote speaker. Excited about that. And um, we have lots of great things to share with you at the annual meeting, so this will be an opportunity to get you in place for that. Motion to approve the change. All right, so the motion is from Mayor Holly Smith. Do I have a second? A second from Bill Wachulis. Do we have uh, any discussion on that? Okay, seeing no discussion, um, any public comment on that change? Okay, seeing none, are there any objections? No objections, that motion carries unanimously. And then explain the City of Cape Coral item, please. Sure. Um, Nancy, you want to kick that one off? Or? We've got, we also have Matthew Creed from, from Cape Coral, I believe. And uh, so they are requesting additional funds to complete a restroom. Um, and I'll let them, run, let them tell you their story. Good morning. Good morning, Council. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, my name is Matthew Creed. I'm with the City of Cape Coral Parks Maintenance Superintendent. I brought along with me a uh, project manager for this project, uh, Gino Notaranis. Um, basically, in 2018, we, uh, we applied for funding for a bathroom to be constructed at Serena Vista Park. Serena Vista Park is more of an environmental uh, area. It's on the northwest spreader of Cape Coral, which uh, is, a, is the waterway from the north side of Cape Coral going out to the Matlache area. Uh, the park is, um, since I've been here, I've only been here about two and a half years, I've noticed a, a great deal more of people coming out there. We uh, started allowing a kayak uh, tour company to launch from there uh, to bring people out um, and, and, and tour the, the spreader there in the, the, uh, the Blue Way area. Um, there is a uh, butterfly garden that uh, friends of Serena Vista Park, which is basically folks that live close to the park, and they, they maintain a little butter, butterfly garden and plant trees and, and really take pride in, in being out there in the park. Um, there also is a manatee viewing area that uh, in the wintertime the manatees will congregate there and a lot of people go out to the park simply just to watch the manatees and fishing is very popular out there. TDC has granted funds for a lot of the projects that have been completed out at Serena Vista Park, so we are very thankful for the, the projects that have already been funded and completed at, out at that park. Um, in 2018, basically, this, this, this project was approved uh, by the TDC funds, <clears throat> and um, the application was submitted, which included a conceptual estimate at $173,000. Uh, it, was, it was approved by TDC in, in 18, like I said. Uh, Lee County re received fully executed documents in December of 2018. Um, received uh, staff and cost proposals from Tetra, Tetra Tech, which is a company that's working on the project, um, <clears throat> in 2019. Um, so Basically, I, don't, I guess I don't need to read through all the, all the bullet points, but uh, we are requesting an additional $175,000 for this project to complete. And uh, Gino here can explain some of, of the cost increases. We had some, uh, some site issues with uh, uh, the South Florida Water Management District, uh, changes in the, the FEMA flood uh, plain regulations, and then some landscape requirements. Um, so. This is a project that we have been working on and moving forward uh, since I started working with the city of Cape Coral, and I just don't want it to, to excuse me, to basically stop. We are moving along with the project, and like I said, Gino can explain some of these the cost increases and why we're asking for the additional funds. And then if you have any questions at the end, we'll be here to answer. Okay. Before Gino goes, I just want to 
point out that the county attorney's office has deemed one portion of the additional request as ineligible. So the dollar amount is 173230. Yes, correct. Thank you. But no, just wanted to you it, just get the number right, that's all. <laughs> All right, just to kind of uh, expand on what Matt said, uh, there was three major issues that we ran into during the design effort that increased the project cost. Um, originally, it was just a, uh, a bathroom facility, and now we're expanding the whole 8.3 acre site to include uh, additional um, stormwater improvements, detention and retention areas per the Southwest Florida Water Management District permitting. Um, it was approved back in 2006. There was a master plan. It expired, so the district said we had to bring the whole park into compliance. Um, another issue we ran into was the FEMA flood designation. It's now uh, FEMA flood zone A, which requires us to put an additional three feet of fill in the project, or we could put uh, a dry flood proofing system, which is cost prohibitive. It was an extra $40,000 for the project just to do that. So the cheapest inexpensive way was to do the additional fill. However, you had to uh, put ADA compliance railings, uh, that such, but it was still half the cost of what it was to do the dry flood proofing. And then the uh, codes changed recently in the last couple of years for the additional landscaping. So with this particular site, it added about another $30,000 for the additional landscaping and irrigation. So that's where the extra um, 143, 150,000 came from that Matt's asking for. So uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Yeah, Mr. Wells. Um, I appreciate the fact that from what I can tell, you're coming to us with not a mid-cycle new capital project here. We're talking about um, unforeseen increases in expenses due to new codes, elevations, things like that. So um, I appreciate that. Um, because I would see that as typically needing to take place during the beach and shoreline meeting. So I have uh, no issue with moving this forward on the 173 to 30, but I'll wait to hear if anybody else has a thought from council. I have a, a couple questions. Does the total cost of the project was, and, and how much did Cape Coral match for that? Matt. We do not have a, any matching funds for this project. Uh, the original cost was that we requested in 2018 was one hundred and seventy three thousand nine hundred and sixty dollars and we are asking for the, an additional um, one hundred seventy three thousand two hundred and thirty dollars um, normally the city has a ten percent contingency so in total it would roughly be three hundred and forty nine thousand dollars six hundred and ninety with a with ten percent contingency that Cape Coral is matching, not the which the contingency portion is thirty one thousand seven hundred ninety dollars. Yeah, I, I always like to see a match. I, I always like to hear of some numbers that we're putting skin in the game as, sure. as well. Um, and I would ask the city attorney if you could just um, briefly let us know your. I, I've read, but maybe verbally, if if you are comfortable and where you stand on this. Uh, I reviewed it to make sure it complied with the Florida statute as well as um, the county ordinance. There was a portion that did not comply um, with the Florida statute, which was the uh, videoing of the site. Um, and I believe that was $2,500 that I determined was ineligible, but all the other costs were eligible uh, under the Florida statute for funding through uh, TDT dollars. Okay. Thank you, appreciate that. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. The picture that I'm looking at of the, is that the restroom? Is that what it's going to look like? That is a sample of the, the restroom. Uh, so it would look something similar. Like yes, correct. And it's a prefab that just prefab to to bring it on a crane and drop it in and then yes, takes it off. Right? Uh, okay. There it is right there. Yep, I see it. So it is a prefabbed um, two portion restroom. Um, another thing too, when I came to, to Cape Coral, we have very basic restrooms in our, in our, uh, at most of our parks, so the Friends of uh, Serena Vista Park, they asked for maybe if they can have some st storage space because they do maintain this butterfly area. Uh, so I increased the size of, of the bathroom, and this way this will have three bathrooms, so men's, women's, and basically a family-style bathroom, plus a little storage that 
our crews out there can have some equipment in the Friends of Serena Vista Park that maintain this butterfly area and this natural area could use a portion of that for storage of their wheelbarrows or some, some hand tools and whatnot. But that is um, it, the, <laughs> the bathrooms that have been placed in Cape Coral throughout the years are very basic block shape prefabs. This one has more of a coastal vibe. It's a, there are some homes across the canal that will have, you know, being within view of this bathroom. So I wanted to try to make more of a coastal theme for the, the bathroom style and a little more aesthetically pleasing to people coming to the park, more or less. I think you've done a great job with that. Thank you. Anything else? Go ahead. Ellen, go ahead. Um, so I guess, I, did, I mean, this, now this project has doubled in cost. I'm sorry, what's that? The project has doubled in cost, basically from 170, right? And now you're asking for another 170, correct? That's correct. So can you tell me the breakdown? So it sounds like 30,000 in landscaping. Yeah, I can give you okay. a, a rough estimate here. Um, not the bathroom, it's all the other stuff. Do you want me to break down the whole entire cost from the engineer's estimate it's or just the- ticket, I, like it looks like a okay. Southwest Florida Water Management District permitting and then the FEMA flood designation which requires- to put So basically, down. just in a nutshell, it was originally the bathroom footprint, footprint, what you're looking at here, but now for the Florida Water Man Management District permit, we had to expand the retention, dry detention areas for the whole entire site, which has added an additional cost for the fill. So now it's just not the footprint anymore, it's the whole eight acre site. So, um, so basically the additional fill that we're looking at for, for the project was around 120,000 for the retention detention areas and then building the structure up an additional three feet and then uh, basically another 30,000 for the landscaping. So that's the additional costs. So the retention on the site, the eight acres, is because we're putting a bathroom on it? Well, the whole site's gotta be in a compliant, but yes. Yeah, that triggered it. So any improvements moving forward, we don't have to get a full Southwest Florida Water Management District permit. We just have to do a minor mod, which is $100, but we had to uh, you know, do the brunt of it now. So we're actually paying them to do future work on the site as well, not just for the bathroom, right? We're investing in this site. Long yes, time. basically, yeah, but you know, it's the first one in, unfortunately. So once we do this project, we have to comply now. But. I will add, you know, this is, uh, you've invested in this park, I mean, quite a bit over the years, Nancy yeah. probably could clarify, but I mean, the, the park was essentially developed with tourist tax dollars. You got a kayak launch there, you paid for um, so viewing park, area, uh, right. Yeah, this, this park is, a lot of the projects that are, that have been completed at this park were funded by TDC dollars. Um, let's see, the, uh, the sidewalks with the manatee imprints on it, the uh, manatee viewing area, we're still in progress with a, another part of the project that was already approved for the funding from TDC uh, for the shoreline stabilization and um, boardwalk that's currently a project that we're working on as well. Uh, so really a lot of the, the dollars have gone in, into this park and there's still projects that I look at that I would like to complete and I will probably be back in front of you to ask for those dollars. So, you know, um, it's, a, it's a great little space and, and the, the area up there in the, the northwest and northern part of southwest Cape Coral is growing ex exponentially, exponentially, so we have a lot more visitors to this park, and, and like I said, we're, we're, we're allowing kayak tours through the area, and it, it's, 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 it's a great place to go for the people of Cape Coral. So. It is. I, I think it's a great enhancement great. from that area. I mean, everything's, you know, it, it's moving in all different directions up there. And I think with the cost, I'm not going to be surprised if, if we have more coming forward to us because we know the supply and the cost um, are just astronom astronomical right now and that might continue for different types of supply chains and, and I, can, I can support what you're doing here and I think you're doing a good job and doing the best that you can to keep the cost down and, and I think that's quite a bit out of your control but I think as a community enhancement and what our dollars are supposed to be going to, I can support you. I appreciate it. I don't disagree with the project at all. I, I think where I'm having heartburn is on the, the match. I mean, I, I, you asked the question, I don't know if I got the right understanding of the answer. So the 170,000 was originally approved, how much of that was from Cape Coral? It's, it's Zero. No funding from TDC. No, no funding. We didn't, 
this is not a match project, project correct? And don't These I are, have a problem with that? as well, but this project is, it has been in the works, and I think that's going to have to be considered when we look at today for potential funding of, of, of what we're putting out, is making sure that those matches are coming. I think that's really important, but I know this one is in the works, and I, I hesitate to try to stall something that we've been helping with. Unfortunately, the, the costs and everything are, are beyond all of our control right now. But that's my I, I guess I would add there's no increased construction cost because of pro like because of supply chain or product in this app, right? It's all about a change in structure of the site, FEMA, and then of course adding landscaping. So like that's a little concern in the back of my head that says like I know that everything I'm hearing is that, you know, a piece of wood that used to cost this is now three times this. So mm -hmm. I'm you know, as long as this project's gonna get done, but I I guess I would set the tone that if you're coming back we probably would, it's easier to do things like this if there's some skin in the game from Cape Coral, especially if the TDC is funding the entire thing, which now we're setting it up for, an, for, all, for you to use for all these great projects, and I'm not opposed to it. But it, we can't be the only source all the time. So I would suggest as you're looking at you know, coming back to us, we're putting it back in cycle so that it's part of the whole ask when we look at numbers or, or put some skin in the game. Because I, you know, I think we're gonna see this with, cost issues because we have a lot of projects sitting outside that we that I expect are going to come back right because we're hearing it everywhere right. so this isn't even construction based this has to do with the with the site like this is a different yeah. issue so um, that's my two cents which is beyond your control so right, right. I get that and and I agree 100% with what you're saying that um, I inherited this position basically and and I know that uh, speaking with colleagues at Cape Coral, that we haven't done a lot of match in, in for our request for funding for projects, and it's something we can certainly internally um, talk about and say, hey, we're, we're asking for this, what are we matching? I, I completely agree with that. Excellent, any further? Yes, Ms. Cohen. Um, on that same construction cost, there aren't any additional construction, actual, like, The, the original building was about forty thousand dollars. The the that was in the original um, scope of work. The the one that uh, is like this is more of uh, it's about it's one hundred fifteen thousand dollars when I quoted it in two thousand nineteen. So there is some additional cost on the actual structure that is being placed on the on the site as well. One option is we could temper the amount and have Cape Coral put some more skin I, in the game. I, I just, yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I, I would assume if I'm a betting man that 80% of use of that is not residents of Cape Coral, not tourists. I think you mentioned most of the residents are going to be using that. Well, the, res the residents have a, a little area they kind of maintain, but they're, like I said, there, there's more and more people coming, and, and I know Cape Coral has lots of Airbnbs and, and rental properties and people like to go out there and see the nature. There's there's gopher tortoises, there's, you know, uh, purple martins, there's different, it's a different type of tourism, I guess, than you know, big island hopper fest, which was a great presentation, Nancy, that was great. I'm gonna try to go to it next year. But uh, yes, I mean, uh, it's it's a, it's definitely, people do come to these, these areas of Cape Coral, I mean, I don't know how many times I see people looking for the owls, so, <laughs> you know, and they're from out of, out of town, out of state, uh, and whatnot, so yes. Uh, but it is it is visited by all kinds of people, so. Are there funds available from Cape Coral to do some match? For this Any? particular project? Yes. Um, I, w I mean, I would have to go through my budget and, and, and talk with the, the director, Director Runyon. We could also table it to come back. Well, it's an out of cycle because you're ready to go, right? Like that's what it says in one of these pages, right? Um, they're currently ready to submit this project to, to procurement for a request for bid package. So further delaying this request could require additional funds if material and labor costs are to increase. I 
think the question sounds like, you know, whether we want to approve this without going back to Cape Coral and saying, we'd like you guys to put some skin in the game. That's kind of what I'm hearing as I'm listening to everybody. You know, do we want to set a point or a limit or just some, what is the level of skin that we feel that Cape Coral should be putting into this in that the project has doubled? And, and I think if we can come up with a number, we can send them back to go to the to Cape Coral Council and say, look, if you want this done, you know, we're going to ask for a little piece of your skin and we're going to give you some of our blood and, uh, and that'll make everybody sort of happy. I mean, is that what we're all kind of thinking about? So we need to put a number on. I mean, what are we saying? 25,000 that they need to put in into the game? A percentage of the increase? I mean, what, what are we looking at? Any thoughts? I would say a percentage if we're looking for a match. I think that Cape Coral probably would likely have this. For the increase? Mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the budget. Um, you know, they've, they've got a general fund and different funds that they can be looking at. At the same at. time, we don't want to hold things up. We want, right. we want to mm -hmm. make sure that things can go forward. So. Let's get Jennifer back in here and put her on the spot. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, these, these are all good questions. I, I think about, um, okay, I think about it from a multiple different angles. So the budget just recently got passed in September. So, you know, it's, it's probably not in the budget to provide a match from Cape Coral. So now you're talking about probably having to do a budget amendment or move some things around in their, in their city's budget in order for them to provide a match. I mean, I'm going to be completely upfront here. It does seem like what we're being asked to fund now is a much bigger project or more expanded project than what was approved when we probably saw the original application and approved it. But that was back in 2018. So, I mean, that that's something that, you know, I, I feel like, Hey, we got in the door with this project, and then we did a little bit of work on it. And now we're gonna we're gonna come back and ask for, hey, we're already in the door with this project, but we also want to do this and this and this while we're here. It's kind of like the same thing that happens uh, to us sometimes in our homes when we invite somebody over to do work in our homes. So, I, you know, as far as this this project, um, I would assume we have had an incredible year. And tourist development tax collections. Uh, in fact, I don't just assume that. We know we've had a record-breaking year to the tune of probably maybe 11 million more than we would have ever collected in our best year previously. We know that there's been a major increase in vacation rental income. We know that there's been a major increase in bed tax being paid from vacation rentals. And so a lot of that increase has probably come from vacation rentals in Cape Coral. So the the money to cover the 173000 is probably there from the increase we've seen in vacation rentals that are probably in Cape Coral. So I, I, can, I can rationalize it in a way to pay for it. it so there's the, there's the part of me that wants to speed, go ahead and just keep the project on track, get it done on time for expediency's sake. We had a great year. We've got the money. A lot of it probably did come from vacation rentals that could have been located in Cape Coral. It's not a hard stretch for me to believe that those vacationers did go to this park. So I'm okay there. I just wanted to point out that I would like to, in the future, not see us do these big expansions like of the project after we've already been approved. Try to, try to keep the project as close to the application that we approved as, as possible, Absolutely. if that makes sense. So yeah. two quick questions. One, am I right in saying this project can't move forward, though, without the work? because of Southwest Florida Water Management District and FEMA? Like, it has changed the landscape of, or the, the concept of the whole project, correct? Like, you can't put that in there if we don't do this. Correct? That's correct, yeah. And then, so I guess I would, I would suggest that maybe we move forward with this, but you need to know, and we're not picking on you because you inherited right. this, but knowing that moving forward, this is, this is the tone of who we are, right? We're looking for some match from Cape Coral or we may ask you to hold off on that next project till there is a match in the budget for, you know, and those type of things. So we've had a good year. I don't think we're done with this in yeah. regards to ask coming back with construction costs because we've got, we've got a, I don't know, probably 25, 35 projects sitting out there that are all in process or permitting, which apparently takes forever and a day. You know, when you ask for money two years ago, now it's, it's going to be 2022 before this thing's done. And so... I, you know, we're just trying to manage it as best as we can. So just know that this is kind of who we are as you move forward with us. I, so I would make a motion that we move forward with this amount to get this project done, but know that we may not go any further as additional projects sit there or you know, on that site until we, until we see how it goes. 
Okay, so we, we have a motion for approval, though, of, of the request yeah, as yeah, presented. Okay. And, and I, would, I would second that with a very, yeah, you know, just really echoing, um, we are not setting a precedent, I don't think, but I think matches are going to be extremely important. Yeah. And we're going to really be watching that. And, and like you said, we're going to have more, likely more of these coming back to us. So I'd second that. Yeah, so the motion is from uh, Ms. DeFesquale and the second's from Mayor Smith. And, um, real quick, Tony, I'm well, going to... Just one other comment I want to make. Um, is the permitting all in place for this? Yes, all the delivers, the design permit, everything's everything ready to ready go. go. It's a shovel-ready project. So in a perfect world, okay, but construction always doesn't work that way. Where do you see the timeline of all this happening? Well, I see. If, if everything were to go perfectly for you, when would the site development be done and when would the restrooms be planted and operational? Okay. Um, well, we got to go to... Uh, publicly bid it through our procurement folks. So that's probably a 60 to 90 day process, get it on the council agenda approved, getting a contractor selected. Actual construction, probably nine months to a year respectively. The biggest unknown right now is the design or the construction of the actual restroom facility. It's precast. I don't know what their backlog is or the leave time. So that's the only issue that's kind of in limbo right now, but I would say nine months to 12 months. Well, if we approve this, we could actually go into the next cycle to give the money if we had to, they could, you know, then, then they could maybe, by that time, city uh, Cape Coral could then do a match with the first thoughts process. It's that long out. I mean, I'm saying we don't want to put you guys out there and say, oh, we're not going to give it to you, but we'd like to maybe give it to you with a shrink tank. I don't know, because time-wise, it seems like it's going to be a long time. Is that possible, or am I, am I wrong? Yeah, I, you know, it's, I apologize. Uh, we've got an important note here that we'll, we'll read at the end of the meeting. Um, one of the things I was thinking just hearing about this is, yeah, perhaps maybe you even had come to us a little prematurely project yet. When you, when you put it out to procurement and get the final cost, you may find that it, that's when you'll see the construction increases come in too. Do you anticipate that or how good are you on on estimating what this actual final construction cost is going to be. In a perfect world, our engineer overestimates the cost of the production. Hopefully, the numbers will come in less. I mean, it's... Yeah. Yeah, because that, that would be... So, so I think what you're hearing from the council is then, if I'm kind of putting everybody together, you know, we're, we're willing to help you get to where you need to get today. The, uh, but, but when you do put it out to procurement, if it comes back even higher than what we anticipated, it's going to be tough. Maybe you go to the Cape Council instead of the TDC for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm proud. I'm not coming back. <laughs> well, and, and how um, long does your well, it, it, my process my thought pat process to come and ask right right now is because I don't want to move forward with the project that's not really fully funded. Um, so that's why um, I reached out with with people and I said, listen, you know, the costs are coming a lot higher, and how do I move forward? Because I, I want to be able to provide this for the, 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 the users of the park. I mean, there's, we have Porter Johns out there and they get tipped over, they get vandalized, they get, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's messy and yeah. this is a, 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 people don't think of, it's just a bathroom, but it, it's really needed on this, at this location. Yeah. Um, so I, I just felt more comfortable finding out if, if we could get the funding and, and move forward with the project and that, that's why we're here. And again, Matt said at the beginning, and I know uh, there was a question asked if this was just for the residents of the city of Cape Coral. I would say no, because it has uh, more Lee County implications because of the Manatee viewing site, mm -hmm. and it's got a kayak launch facility. We've got future plans to build a boardwalk. So it's not your typical park in the city of Cape Coral, so there's more of a draw there. It's a great, it's a great experience, and we saw the value in it when we approved it originally, and I, I think people still, I think we all see the value in it still, too. So it's just... Uh, a logistics kind of question here. All right, what other comments or questions do we have before we go ahead and call the uh, question on the motion on the floor? All right, seeing no further questions or discussion then, um, are there any objections to the motion on the floor? Yes. Okay, one, Councilwoman Bonk. Okay, very good. So the motion carries um, uh, with one objection, Councilwoman Bonk. Thank you very much, folks. I appreciate your, uh, your help with that conversation. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. And uh, next, we under for council information, we have two things we wanted to. Congratulations, by the way, uh, to the folks from Cape Coral. Uh, thanks for your presentation today. Um, 
Glenn, you had something that you wanted to bring up under four council information related to the Commissioner Kiker Preserve, and uh, please share that with the uh, with the group. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Council members, if you can bear just a little bit more project talk here, I do apologize, but uh, we do want to let you know that the Board of County Commissioners on Tuesday will be considering a professional services contract for the Larry Kiker Preserve project that we had discussed previously. And you all had graciously assented to some funding for that on very short notice, which allowed the BOCC to incorporate it into the current year budget in, in quick order. And, and so we're already starting. And, uh, and, and so I just wanna do a couple things, clarify what that project is and how it's funded to your previous discussion that you just had. Uh, and then secondly, uh, also commit that we will bring you more formal updates as we go, because this is a huge project. So, um, so with that said, uh, it, it's a $1.8 million planning, design, and permitting contract with Kimberly Horn, two-thirds of which really is related to the park amenities piece. And so most of that probably qualifies for TBT funding. We're working through that with uh, County Attorney Fraser. Um, so roughly two-thirds of the contract would, would be tourism-oriented infrastructure. Uh, you know, that, that is a, I mean, this is conceived on a massive scale. Like we said, the national park model is what we're looking to, to create numerous amenities, shared use paths, hiking trails, an interpretive center, fishing piers, campgrounds, there's scenic overlooks, all the regular amenities. Um, you know, I, I mean, this is like a trolley tram sort of tour is, is imagined. There's all kinds of things that would happen out here. And, uh, and, and so the, the design itself is gonna take, and I've got uh, Jesse Lavender here to answer questions, as well as Roland Natalini from the Natural Resources side, but the design itself and the permitting, I mean, that's gonna take a couple of years. And so, uh, and, and so with the funding that you've committed, which we moved over from the, 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 the ball part, the uh, ball field expansion that lapsed, uh, you know, it will cover this design and permitting and then still leave approximately 4.3 million for the future phases, be they construction, what have you. Now the current estimates for all of that or something on the, and it's just a wild estimate at this point. Of course, we won't know until we get through the design, but it's, it's, it could be tens of millions, as much as 30 million. And, and that will come from a wide variety of funding sources. So you'll have general fund contribution. Uh, you will certainly try to draw down state grants where we can. Uh, it may be that the board will commit some American Rescue Plan Act funding to it uh, where they can. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's gonna be significant matches to it if you don't even include the 42 plus million that the county already spent just to acquire the, the property, which is 4,000 acres. So, uh, you know, with all of that said, the other thing that I want to, and I was gonna invite Roland up to talk a little bit about the natural resources piece of this, the water quality, the flood attenuation, mm -hmm. all very important besides just the tourism aspect. Since we've run long, I'll, I'll leave that to your discretion if you want to ask him questions. But the, the last thing that I do just want to emphasize is that we do have budgeted right now for this fiscal year at year's end, common reserve balance of $25.3 million. Now that's just common reserve. That's not your, that's not your um, debt service funds. It's not your stadium funds. It's not your beach and shoreline. It's just the common reserve. So with 25.3 million, given where you are at your minimum reserve levels that you've specified, you're still looking at $16 million of excess reserves available for projects. So if we identify, for instance, there was discussion when we did this originally about uh, sports venues, since we were taking from ball field expansion and moving it to this park, um, you know, I would just say you have more than adequate resources to fund a sports development project should one be identified or any other project. So just, just really wanted to clarify all of that, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, you know, uh, commit to future formal updates and, and answer any questions that we can.
So, so just to summarize, no, no ask for money today. Basically, just trying to be transparent about the, the money that you all uh, allowed us to use for this project last time. So we're going to go ahead and get to work with some of that $6 million. We're going we're gonna to put about $1.8 million of it. Is that what it sounds like? It's $1.8 million, but one-third of that is clearly on the natural resources side and so would not be funded with these monies. We'll fund that out of a different fund. Okay. Yes, sir. Very good. Uh, general fund. But that's, that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that y'all are aware as we're moving forward with this project. It'll be a multi-year project, but we want you to see what we're doing with the money so that you feel comfortable and, 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 and everything like that. So it makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Glenn. Um, and then, Tam, you had some more council information. A well, little uh, bit of housekeeping. A little housekeeping. So if you talked to a VCD staff member when you came into the parking lot and they got your license plate, no worries for you. But if you did not... Please see Fran uh, at the end of the meeting. We want to make sure you, they cha we've changed the parking procedure outside a little bit, and we need to get your license plate so you don't get charged for parking or be fined for parking without paying. So we want to make sure we take care of you. So, and that includes everybody. So please, if we didn't get your license plate, see Fran. Will, will that be ongoing, or are we just going to? That's the ongoing. Good question. We're, we're working on it. <laughs> we're working on it. All right. yeah, no. It, it literally just happened a few days ago, and we're getting used to a new system, so hopefully we'll have a solution for the next time. Very good. All right. And at this time, do we have any, uh, let's start with Ms. Cronin, any member items today? I don't have anything. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Mayor Smith? It's great to be back. Um, I did attend the governor's conference on tourism. It was the first time that I attended, and I it was extremely educational, beneficial, and I just want to say thank you to the staff for making me feel so welcome from the time I got into the room to, you know, I was there, you know, by myself. I joined up with everybody, but just always in contact with me, always saying, hey, we got a seat for you. And I, it meant a lot to me being my first time, so thank you very much. Um, our big news on the island, of course, we have had undertaken a city manager search. Judy Zamamra, after 20 years, retired on, on the 29th of September, and we will be welcoming Dana Souza. Uh, on November 15th is his official start date. He's coming from Naples, and so I hope we'll all, all, we'll all welcome him. So thank you. Very good. Councilmember Member Bonk. Uh, nice to be part of the group, and thank you so much to the staff for welcoming. I'd echo Mayor Smith's comments as well. I attended the Governor's Conference, and you all were very welcome, uh, welcoming, and again, very educational. So looking forward to being part. Good deal. Thank you. We're glad to have you here, too. Uh, Council Member Di Pasquale. Uh, two things. So Florida Restaurant Lodging Association um, was supposed to hold their culinary cook-off this month, which is a, an event where we raise funds, the students cook, and then the funds that we raise basically goes back to them so that we can um, put some money towards some of the, 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 the culinary programs in the high schools. But unfortunately, because of COVID, they're not able to hold the event this year. So without those, without FRLA doing their own events, they are actually partnering with uh, the Greater Fort Myers Chamber and we're doing a workforce housing panel uh, next Thursday at the Embassy mm -hmm. Suites, if you're interested. Or is that this week? I don't even know what day it is. That would be, yeah, next, this, next Thursday, the 21st. Um, and then we're very fortunate to have John Talmud speaking in November, because he's always the most popular speaker at any chamber event that there ever is. So he is our November speaker, because FRLA will be partnering with that, as well as our holiday party. The other thing I wanted to mention is, um, the floor, you know, obviously we're there's they're in committee weeks up in Tallahassee, so so there is some conversation, and maybe you guys can add to this. But visit Florida still has a sunset clause, and so there's there's a couple, you know, we are definitely going to take that on as well as the Florida Chamber. The good news is they are taking it on as well to eliminate the sunset clause. There's some uh, misperceptions. We've heard some uh, some of our local officials kind of talking about. One person actually said that visit that we spend more than visit Florida, that the Lee County VCD spends more on marketing than visit Florida. I'm like, mm, well, so um, so there's some misperceptions out there, but just know that you know some of our local chambers are taking it on as well as others. But know that I think it's in our own best interest. We work with them as a as a visitor and convention bureau ourselves. That we want to remove that. Um, the other perception is it has to do with staffing stability. But we all know that. When you uh, market a destination, you know, you need long-term planning, right? This isn't something you put out for the next six months. We're always talking further out than that. So that's the take we're taking, that this is important to the success 
And if you heard some of the, the data from Visit Florida, we were the only visitor, and, we were the only state to market, right, through COVID because we were open. So, I mean, there's a lot out there. So we really need to be looking at what uh, early 2022 brings the session and, and, you know, and if you want to support what we're doing, but we are going to, we are actively um, asking that the sunset clause be removed. The other thing for business owners is the COVID liability protection that got passed last year. It was the first thing that the governor signed. Well, I don't think we were right? So we're asking to have that put back in place because COVID didn't go anywhere. So we might need another year of that to, um, to kind of go through because that, you know, so you'll see, you'll be hearing some of that and some other things. So I just wanted to let you know that we can expect to hear Visit Florida a lot over the next couple months. And I think we just need to be thinking about that. Or do we take a stand as a tourist development council and get our voice heard? So. Mr. Rachulis. Um, some good news. Condé Nast just released their uh, top resorts in Florida. We had three in the county, um, Pink Shell, South Seas, and the Gasparilla Land. I will note that Pink Shell was number nine. So, so we made the top 10. So, but uh, great to have three in our, our county, so. Congratulations, that's awesome. Mr. Wells? Nothing more, thanks. Right. And Mr. Lappin. Good. Thanks everybody for a great meeting today. We had a lot of, a lot of good discussions. Uh, anything else for the good of the order then? All right, seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.